Hello, everybody, and welcome to Healthier, a podcast designed to help you be the healthiest you've ever been. And today, I know you're going to love this topic, and you're going to love even more Dr. Sylvia Tara, who talks about in her new book, The Secret Life of Fat, and how you can be the right weight. So, Dr. Sylvia, welcome. Thank you. It's so great to be here. It's so great to have you because, you know, the number one question I get every single day, whether I'm coaching startups or dealing with builders, is, oh my God, I've put on weight, Rena, what do I do? We, we as a nation and maybe as a globe have had this sort of love-hate relationship with fat. And I think COVID has just made things so much worse. Um, I think COVID-19 has made all of us gain 19 pounds. So this conversation could not have occurred at a better time. Uh, let's start with your introductions, first of all. You're a PhD in biochemistry. You worked at McKinsey. You went to Wharton for your MBA. I did my undergrad there. And uh, you've, you've worked for uh, pharmaceutical companies. You were working at Abbott. What got you into researching into fat and then writing a book about it? Yeah, what a great question. So I've always had this problem where I gain weight very easily. So I can put on pounds faster than anybody, I think. And I always watch people around me be able to lose weight faster. They would go on a diet, they'd lose weight very quickly. I'd be struggling with the same one pound for a week or so. And you know, I, I saw this so many times and I, I just got frustrated. I was about to go on yet one other diet. And I thought, you know what? I have to just pause for a second and figure out what's going on with my fat. Why is my fat so stubborn? What's different about it? Whose advice do I really need to take on this? And I'm a biochemist by training. So I thought if, if someone can understand fat, surely I can understand fat. So I went on this five-year endeavor to understand everything about fat that I could find. And, and I, I researched, I think I pulled a thousand publications out and read them all, all of the scientific literature. Now I spoke to you know probably 50 scientists around the world about their research on fat. And what I was finding out was so astounding. It answered so many of my questions about why fat was hard to lose for me, why it, it varies among people on how hard it is to lose or how easy it is to lose. And I thought, you know, it, this is so astounding. I have to put this all in a book. And so the book is The Secret Life of Fat. It's everything about fat you never knew. It's all hidden in science and, and the, the research, but tried to make it presentable for people to learn about their fat and what's difficult about their fat. So let's actually make this interview more of a master class because I know uh, there's so much amazing science. And I think I recommend that anyone who's interested in the science and the stories to please pick up your book. Uh, but for this interview, what I'd love to do is give people some very relevant, applicable steps. So guys and gals, get your pens and uh, iPhones ready for making some notes, because hopefully we're going to give you a blueprint by the end of this interview in what you need to do. Uh, let's start with the first question itself, which is, why is fat hated? Because really fat is what keeps us together. Fat is what gives us hormones. It makes us youthful. It allows us to have babies. It's, it's the core of who we are. And yet we hate fat. So step one, we all need to get over the fact that we hate fat. Tell it a little bit about why we must love fat. <laughs> You know, first I'll say fat wasn't always hated. There, there was a time in America where fat was adored and loved um, after the Civil War, right? When, when food was hard to come by, the economy was, was bad, the country was beaten, fat was praised. And, and celebrities were praised for having heft. The ones who had some fat, so, you know, were, were more famous. They, they did very well. There was something called the Fat Man's Club, a very prestigious club where you had to be fat enough to be part of the club. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's amazing here in America. Can we bring it back? <laughs> fat Woman's Club? <laughs> They're trying. And, uh, you know, it wasn't until the economy improved and, and their food became more available. Um, people, you know, could, could eat more. They had more food. They worked in factories. They were a little bit more sedentary than before. And as the nation started gaining weight, some of the leaders became nervous about it, right? Some of the preachers preached about the, you know, the, the taboo of getting too fat. Business leaders worried about the agility of people in factories. They warned about fat. You know, politicians warned about getting too fat. It became this, this kind of movement of, of about fat and people became very conscious of their fat. And this was really the start of the dieting industry. 
because before this, the late women's magazines would, would give advice on how to gain weight for young women, right? How to pad yourself to look like some of the fatter celebrities, how to eat more so that you could gain weight. And around this time, people wanted to start losing weight. They got very nervous about fat. And there's a lot of shysters, right? There were a lot of odd um, kind of diets, like there was a tapeworm diet back then where you eat a tapeworm to siphon off calories then drink poison later to, to kill the tapeworm. There was something called fat off soap that was supposed to melt your fat if you used it. So the, the start of the diet industry, and of course we know how this ended, we have multi-billion dollar dieting industries now, right? Which doesn't that, work. It's an industry that doesn't work. Well, no, they, they keep selling you something on, on hope, hoping it will work, right? But then it doesn't really work because people don't really understand they, they're fat. They just know it's bad to have and they hate it and they want to get rid of it at all costs because we're, we're taught that the less fat you have, the better. And that's really not true. And I think the most astounding thing I found out in my research is that fat is actually an endocrine organ, right? So it's actually producing hormones for your body that your body needs. So it's like skin, you know, skin and just like a square of skin is probably, it's, it's more like tissue, right? Um, but a skin in your totality really is an organ. And so fat is the same way, just a piece of fat is a piece of fat tissue, but then, you know, fat in its totality works like an organ. And it releases two hormones that are really critical. One is leptin, very important for your metabolism, very important for your appetite control, important for reproduction, for your bones, for your brain size, for your immune system. Fat in some really odd way is controlling everything in your body. Um, and adiponectin is another one that's really important. It's directing fat on where to go and how to stay, how to help you keep stay healthy. So your fat is there for a reason. And because fat is so important, your body does not want you to lose it. So when you start losing weight, start losing fat, your body sends out alarm signals saying something's wrong. We're losing this really important organ. And it'll actually help retain fat. It starts to lower metabolism to retain the fat. It starts to increase your appetite to retain the fat. And so your body wants to keep it, even though you don't. And I think that the most important thing is um, it's not a battle, right? I learned to respect fat after all the research I did. When you find out what fat is really doing in your body as an endocrine, you start to understand it's trying to help you, right? And even when you eat too much and you have to store the extra calories in your fat, it's trying to help you. It's trying to not let those nutrients float in your blood and clog your arteries and you know, be in your liver, it's trying to sequester it away from all your organs. So love your fat, respect your fat. It's as important as your colon or your lungs or any of those other organs we run campaigns on to keep them healthy, right? Your, your fat is an organ. And, you, and once you understand it, you can start to really control it, right? You work with your fat, not against it to try to control it. I love that you said respect your fat. Yeah. Because I think if we can change our relationship with it, instead of being scared of it, instead of being fearful and hateful, we started to respect it and give it the, the due amount of, of sort of energy that it needs to have in our lives, then it doesn't need to be such a struggle, right? Yeah, um, I, yeah I agree. If you stop hating it, you, you, work, you work with it, you sympathize yeah. with it. You yeah. the reason. You're not trying to get down to 7% body fat. You're trying to yes. get down to a level that's healthy for you and make sure your, your fat is in the right places, that it's not harming anything, and you move on. But the, you know, I'll never be one of these people that lose 20 pounds in 20 days. It's just, <laughs> there's not a reason to. <laughs> um, everybody is different. The other thing I uncover in the book it, and the course that I have now is all the different components that make us fat. And it's so different for everyone. There's, there's something of a fat blueprint we all have, you know, a so way let's we- talk about that. So what, what how do I, because, you know, I could be anybody, it could be any one of the 10,000, 20,000 people that are going to listen to this. How do you help someone listening to this understand what their fat blueprint looks like? But it depends on a lot of things. So let's talk about what, what factors into how, how easy or hard it is for you to gain or lose weight. So what is gender for sure, right? Girl, babe, when they're born, girl babies have more fat than boys, right? So, so right there, we are just designed to have more. We partition more nutrients into fat. We store fat at two to three times the rate that men do. We get way hungrier after exercise than a man does. So we always have more fat. Um, hormones, right? As we age, a lot of our hormones, start uh, fat-busting hormones like growth hormone, testosterone, estrogen, they all decrease. And so we pack on fat a lot easier. We're not, we don't have the same muscle tone. We don't have the same muscle mass or bone mass. We get fat easier. 
genetics play a part, right? This was a big part of the realization for me. There's certain genes of races, certain populations of people that gain weight easily, right? And I write about the Pima Indians in my book, this population um, of, of uh, Pima Indians that were here, there was one part in Mexico, and the ones that were here that were around Westerners eating Western foods got obese, right? I mean, they started out farming and hunting and they were thin. Westerners started moving in in the 1900s and they started eating Western food and, and the Westerners were thin, right? The Caucasians were thin, but the Pima Indian got really obese. So there's some populations that don't do well on flour and sugar and fats and things like that. And, and you know, and as we become more of a, a polyglot and all these different races move here, I think we see that. That's actually factoring into the obesity rates that we have in America is that we have so many races and not all do well with that. Um, there's specific genes as well, certain mutations you could have that lead to more fat. There's even bacteria and viruses that, you know, that, that lead to more fat. So you that surprised me. The viruses and the bacteria really surprised me. So a healthy gut and more fiber will help you lose weight yeah. versus an unhealthy gut where the bacteria isn't doing its job. And I, it just blew my mind. What about viruses? Oh, viruses was so interesting. So I write about an Indian scientist, actually, Nikhil Durander, who, who discovered one of these viruses. And uh, he noticed in, in chickens that had a virus, they were getting fat. And usually, chick, you know, animals get skinnier when they get, it, they get a virus. So something weird was happening. And uh, they found this SMAM1 virus in India causing fatness in chickens. And he got so intrigued, he wanted to come to America and start his research. And he found a similar virus in the U.S. called 8036. And 8036, if people have had this virus um, at any time, if they've been a carrier, they tend to be fatter than people that haven't had the virus. And they have about a threefold higher rate of having obesity compared to people who never had it. And so, you know, what this virus uh, does, it's, it's an adenovirus. Um, it helps you absorb glucose faster. It's almost like insulin, right? So, so you're absorbing nutrients, you know, out of, out of your bloodstream much faster and you're creating fat and creating more fat cells. And so um, people have had it, yeah, they're heavier. And, and I write about a, a person who had it in the book, um, Randy, right, one of the patients. And he was, he got it, he thinks on it, got it on the farm when he was young. And uh, he always struggled with weight. And uh, he got so fat, he got sent to the hospital. They said, go to this experimental weight loss program. And that's where they tested him for this virus, 8036. And he had it. Wow. And, uh, you, know, you would think he'd be very depressed. My life's over. I have this terrible virus, but he really was empowered. And you know, I, I say this too: knowledge is is power when it comes to fat. Um, and once once he knew that this was a problem, he just really ratcheted back his calories, increased his exercise. He's now well into his 60s, six foot one. He's 1,200 calories a day, and he's super thin, super fit. So there's always something you can do, no matter what your fat blueprint is, no matter what factors that you are fighting in your fat. And it's just understanding what it is. And I would, I would add to that is understanding sort of, you know, what Ayurveda calls the vata pitta kapha, the body type. You know, mm -hmm. we're all sort of born with a certain body type and understanding what that might be allows us to better reconcile with the, the, the body we've been given. I know that there's boys that are vata that struggle in putting on some weight and putting on some meat and looking big and bulky and <laughs> they can't because that's just not who they are. They're thin and lanky. Yeah. Similarly, we have, you know, women that might be kapha and they struggle with trying to meet with these, you know, um, bikini model type uh, book covers. And it's silly because that's just not who they are. That's just not what their blueprint is. And I think it's so important for someone today to really understand what is my blueprint? Who am I? What should my ideal weight be? Not what's on the latest cover of the, of the magazine that I saw, but what is perfect for me at my age? And I think one of the things that I read about is how critical uh, fat is for harm for women in menopause. Yeah, yeah. So, well, estrogen, right? Exactly, exactly. And so, you know, do you want to be in menopause and and be estrogen deficient? Probably not, because you're going to age faster. And then one more thing that you said that I loved was the correlation between having weight and living longer. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that's really we're like the PR team for fat right now. So, <laughs> if that ever needed to be loved, we're the agents. We'll, we'll help it. Uh, help exactly. It, help it. We're being paid by the fat to to make it look good. <laughs> and the voice of fat. How lucky for me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a, a hotly debated topic. There's lots of, of research in this obesity paradox. It's called where you know people. 
they always thought fat led to more heart attack, led to you know, all, all kinds of issues, but what they noticed is that the mortality rate for people who have heart disease, who have you know, some types of, of diabetes and some kind of health conditions, they actually live longer and recover better if they have a little bit more fat, which is so unusual, right? Really, and, and they're not quite sure why. They think it, it serves as an extra supply of calories, extra supply of energy, and just like an extra padding for, for older people. So I know that there's mixed studies that come out on this, but, but nonetheless, I think it's a very interesting topic that your fat, it's, it actually serves as some protection, right? Especially as you get older. Um, fat is, is related to bone, right? Our bone mass, our bone density is related to how much fat we have. Bone and fat kind of love each other. So, you know, bones, uh, the, the osteocalcin, which actually promotes insulin, which helps you gain fat. And then fat through leptin and through estrogen actually builds bone. So they have this co-working relationship, fat and bone. Our brain size is linked to fat. Um, people with anorexia, their, their brains actually get, get thinner and lighter. They lose volume. Our immune system only is linked to fat. And even wound healing who are, have anorexia, they don't heal as quickly, right? Because leptin's involved in the, in the immune system. So, so many purposes, you know, for our fat through the, the hormones it has and, and, you know, how it's functioning with us, it's actually quite critical. All right. So now that we've convinced everyone that's listening that they shouldn't go to a target number that's below what the ideal BMI would be, like stick in your ideal BMI. Let's talk about people that really have put on excess weight because of excess wine um, and other things like chocolate brownies that get baked in my home every day. So for those who truly are struggling with the added COVID weight and are you know, on track now to saying, no, I need to get back my health, Let's talk about what is a recommended blueprint. I know you've talked about intermittent fasting, but what are some of the things that they can do knowing that for some people it's harder to lose weight and for some people it's harder, uh, it's very easy to gain weight? Yeah, so I, you have to see where you are in the fat spectrum. That's, that's part of the blueprint, right? Is you know, what age are you? Are you at the age where you're starting to lose those hormones, right? Where you don't have as many fat busting hormones like estrogen, testosterone, or, or growth hormone. You know, are, are you male or female? You know, um, do you think there's an inherited component to it? Were, was your family heavy, right? Did you yo-yo diet? That's another key part of the fat blueprint. If you've yo-yo dieted, um, it's a lot harder for you to lose weight than it is for someone who hasn't before. Right? And one of the reasons is um, when you lose weight, um, when you start losing fat, you start losing leptin. So fat produces a hormone called leptin. Leptin controls your appetite. It gets released from fat. It goes to your brain and it, it tells your brain, we're pretty satiated. We have enough fat here. We're doing pretty well. We feel good overall. Also controls metabolism, leptin. And so it, it keeps your metabolism fairly high, right? At a, at a, at a good level. When you start losing, say, 10% of your weight or more, you start reducing the amount of leptin and your body overreacts to this and thinks, oh my gosh, we're losing fat. Something's wrong in the world. There's not enough nutrition. Conserve. It controls your appetite. You, your hypothalamus senses less leptin. You, you look for food everywhere. There, there are people who've lost like 10% of weight. It's, it's shown through fMRI images and other experiments. They're constantly driven to seek food. Um, they also have a slower metabolism, about 22% slower right, than someone who's not lost weight because they, they use a different muscle uh, uh, fiber for burning energy that's much more efficient. So their, their bodies become more efficient. So you have a higher appetite, you know, more efficiency, your body's trying to conserve energy. And this effect, right, you, you person who's, who's you know, in the state has to eat about 400 calories less than someone who's, who's naturally at a low weight to begin with. So someone who's, say, 170, they've lost 20 pounds to get to 150, will have to eat about four or 500 calories less every day, right? 20% less calories every day than someone who's naturally at 150 to begin with because of that slowing of metabolism. Um, and that effect lasts for years. It doesn't just go away at the end of your diet. It's been studied for six years and they're not even sure it goes away for everybody. So you might be you know, at a state where you have to eat less all the time. And this, it's really important because I know when I was dieting, I always thought that, well, I just have to get, you know, lose these pounds and I can eat normal again, right? <laughs> it is not a temporary thing. And, and I learned this from the effect of leptin. Once this happens, you have a different body now. Once you've lost weight, you will be on this diet possibly forever. So, you know, I always say in my book and in my course, you have to find a diet that works for you. You know, socially, you can stay on it. It works with your family life and your business life psychologically you can stand it it's got a, you know enough of the foods you can you can handle if you don't like cooking and it requires cooking a lot of it it's not the right diet for you 
I mean, it works biologically. You're actually losing weight on it. Um, pick that and then stay on it. Plan to stay on this for years and possibly forever. And, and so where you are on the fat blueprint, if it's really hard fat to lose, you'll be on this diet for a very long time. And, and that's the point of diagnosing the fat. You know, what are the factors that make you fat? How hard is it going to be for you to lose fat? And then you pick the appropriate diet and you can actually tailor it for yourself. It's so critical for, I think, all of us to realize your insight that you cannot trick the body. If you think you're going to trick the body with whatever short-term craziness, it's going to redo itself to make sure that it's now ready for your insanity. So whatever craziness you did to lose five pounds, you've now basically messed up your body's programming. That's how I think of it. Like a pro our body is a code yeah. and it's, you recoded it and it's, it's smarter than you. And it's going, okay, so she's crazy. I need to recode myself to make sure that she stays safe and she stays healthy. So I think the biggest thing that I got, again, from, from reading your book and from your brilliant insights was don't try to cheat the body. Don't try to cheat the system. If you've put on weight because of binge eating, eating really late, eating junk food, all you really need to do is clean that stuff out right? Stop overeating, stop binge eating, stop the excessive sugar, don't open packages, but don't do anything silly. Like I'm going to go on a juice fast to lose weight because you're, you're going to reprogram your body and you're going to suffer what you found, which is frightening. You're going to suffer the consequences of that recoding for years, six years, or it could be even life. And it's just not worth it. I mean, the best thing you can ever do is not gain weight to begin with, because once you do, right, you've now changed the, your body composition, you've changed your biochemistry. So, so like on, on the fat spectrum, on the blueprint, if there's a, say a young man, 22 years old, has gained 10 pounds and has to lose it, that's going to come off in about two weeks. And all they have to do probably is exercise a little bit more, right? Maybe lower some yeah. carbs. Yeah. Compare that to a woman who's 55, has had two kids, has yo-yo dieted her whole life, and now has 50 pounds to lose that's a whole different haul, right? That's a very long process. The fat's more vascularized, more sources of getting fat. Um, the hormones are lower for her, right? The yo-yo dieting is factored in and you have to try really hard. So, so you, you have to take care of your body from, to begin with. If you have it, it's okay, right? It's just, it might take you a lot longer, right? To How fix it. Longer. So let's, Let's give them some good news because I think now we've depressed everybody by telling them. It's not <laughs> well, if you're in menopause and you put on 10 pounds, it's going to take yeah. forever. Yeah. Um, so what should someone do? So, so let's take exactly that as an example. There's a fifth, let's take an average of, you know, 55 year old woman who's spent the last 12 months binge eating because of fear. And I'm completely convinced I upped my intake and I'm, I've never been a big eater. Like I like food, but I've never been a binge eater. Yeah. I'm out eating everyone in my family. I mean, I will sit down and take in 1500, 1800 calories in one sitting and, so still, feel hungry. I didn't believe it. <laughs> and still be hungry, like still be rummaging in the pantry. Mm. My family hides cook boxes of cookies because they know if they don't, they'll be gone. And I think it's a fear response. I think there's a subconscious, consciously have no fear, but clearly there's a subconscious fear. My body is reacting to that with, I think she needs a layer of fat around her. And I think that's what's been happening. I think we all have a very deep subconscious fear because we're going through some very traumatic times. And the way the body responds to that is to say, it's, it's times of trauma. I need to build some fat layer on, on this person. And so let's get them to eat. What can we do, um, Dr. Tara, what can we do to start to unwind from last 12 months uh, weight gain? A lot of it is stress eating, right? I think COVID produced a lot of stress in people. You're home, you don't know what's happening. And there's plenty of research to show that candy sales go up during stressful times, times of uncertainty in, in the political landscape or the economy. And you're home and you, and you feel out of control, you kind of take it out and, and, and food makes you happy. It reduces, you know, produces insulin, produces all these hormones that make you happy, right? So I think it's a natural high. So, I mean, what, what you do from here, a lot of it is mind over fat. It's getting control on behavior again, right? Coping with the stress. 
um, you know, putting in, I hate to say it, but, but it's kind of a willpower at this point, right? And where you have to retrain your behaviors to be more disciplined around food. And I have a whole chapter around that in a chapter in my course called Mind Over Fast, right? Where you talk about how, how to um, kind of exert your control again. And you can start with even small things like, um, you know, there's research that shows that people who do an exercise where they stop swearing for two weeks, right? They actually get better at handling stress overall. Like they, they just get better at being in control. So you start with small steps and you, you work up to successive steps where you get more in control. And then that starts to feel good, right? And that builds on itself. Um, but like the, the person who's 55, like the menopausal woman we talked about, how does she get back in control of COVID or not? Like, let's just say it's regular life even, right? That's going to be a longer haul and you just have to face it, right? So if you have some kind of disadvantage, like you've yo-yo dieted or you're older, um, you have to ratchet it up more, right? So one thing to stop doing is comparing yourself to everybody else because your path is going to be different. Every, each of our paths is really individual. Now, for the older woman, don't look at your, your husband or your or any, you know, male relatives where they just have to work out a little bit and lose weight because that won't be you. And if you compare yourself to that person, you'll feel unlucky, <laughs> you'll feel down. That's not you, right? And we, then you'll eat some more. There's, there's a whole world of us that are in this, this hard to lose fat. And then we need to start a bond and a, and a party. Because <laughs> the fat woman's club, I'm telling you, it's time has arrived. <laughs> there is that's actually a secret life of fat community. And I'm going to get on there. We're going to all do this together. But just you have to ratchet it up. So what's going to be important for that woman is, is intermittent fasting can work great. If you have stubborn fat now, like there's a different prescription for you versus the 22 year old male more watch the time that you eat not just what you eat so so cut out sugars cut out okay. some of the time, more leafy greens more salads and watch the time you eat the more you can fast like an extend the overnight fast the faster that weight's really going to come off the stronger your willpower will get as well and you'll get it in control and it starts to feel okay the first five days are, are pretty hard right um, but after that it starts to get better and if your lifestyle can't tolerate not eating dinner with your family or whatever it is that you do if that's too much fine fast during the day right as long as you have a say 14 to 16 hour fasting window right that extends the overnight fast you're gonna lose weight and does 14 work or does it really have to be 16 for me it's 16 depends on how stubborn your fat is right so you can start with 12 or start with 14 if you feel like it's going slow go to 16. i go to 18 sometimes when i really want to you know get the pounds off and, and i lose weight very slowly so you have to be patient. There's mind over fat. You gotta do the exercises to get ready. You gotta be really patient. Know that you're on your own journey, not anybody else's. Yeah. And you have to be a little bit more restrictive with yourself. Um, find a diet you like. If, if you like eating more often, hey, low carb, the Atkins type diet actually does work, but it's very limiting. You know, if, if you're more of, you don't like to be told what to do all the time, I found intermittent fasting to be great. I can eat almost whatever I, I want, or not really, not, not in reckless behavior, but I have more food latitude in the time I eat compared to if I want to eat all the time and be on the Atkins diet. So that the window of eating matters, what you eat is going to matter as well. And um, Are you a keto fan? Do you think keto is something that people should consider, even if it's vegetable, vegetarian keto? I think so, it's especially if... You know, you're really good at sticking to a lot of different rules because keto has a lot of rules, right? As far as what you can eat, how food is prepared, all kinds of things like that. If that's right for you, there's a behavioral component too, which is why I say the diet has to work for you socially, psychologically, biologically, right? So if you, if that's your personality, it's good. It works. You can eat more. You have a longer, I think, eating window as well. Um, I know for me, I'm less obedient, say. Like, I don't like to have a bunch of rules. I don't like my, my life to be around a diet. I find that I can have, um, you know, I'll eat something around like nine o'clock, a couple hundred calories for breakfast, maybe a piece of whole wheat toast and then a boiled egg. For lunch, I have a big leafy green salad. I like it because fiber stretches your stomach. It stretches your stretch receptors in your stomach, which makes you feel full. You train your microbiome to have the right diversity so that you're not extracting a lot of calories out of, of your food, right? A lot more is passing. Um, and and it, it's filling and it lasts a long time. I do that, a big one, big salad with some protein, and then I eat a little bit of a snack at three, and I just don't eat again until the next day. It Wait, hurts. what time do you stop eating? Three or four o'clock, typically. Wow, that's impressive. So you don't eat from three or four till 10? Yeah, nine or 10 the next day. If, I'm in, if it's bothering me a lot, I'll have a few, a few nuts at night, like some almonds or something like that, right? 
Um, but this works for me. And, and you've trained I, your body for that. So I trained my body for it. I don't like to fast during the day. For me, it's distracting, especially if I'm trying to get work done or do something. So I like eating in the day. Okay. I've known people that have done the opposite. They, they fast through lunch and they eat a light dinner. It works for them too. So again, what works for you? Yes. Um, but I found for really stubborn fats, you have to stick to a diet really, um, you have to be really adherent. You can't go off, you can't cheat compared to that 22 year old male, right? Who, who can. Um, the older you are, the more stubborn your fat is. Stay very adherent. If it's keto, fine. If it's, you know, an Atkins kind of thing that works, and if it's fasting, fine. But really stay on it. Watch the sugar and the flour and watch the eating window. Even if you don't. What about uh, exercising, fasted exercising, as it's called? Have you done that or do you find that that works really well? <laughs> I do. So I do this at night. I do HIT, right? High intensity. You do work. do HIT. Okay. Yeah. So I, I know working out. So this is a thing for, for women to watch out. And I've got a whole chapter on women versus men. Women get a lot hungrier after exercise than men do, right? And it's been, it's been shown. If you, they go through an intense bout of exercise, say they burn off 600 calories or more, they produce about 33% more ghrelin, which is a hormone from your stomach that makes you hungry. Right, so if you let women after exercise go to a buffet, they'll load up and overcompensate more than men will. So you gotta be careful with this. And, and for anybody, male or female, right, exercise can provoke hunger. So because I fast at night, I also exercise at night. I do hit, um, and I probably do about another 40 minutes or so of, of cardio, you know, and, uh, three times a week. And I go right to bed because I, I won't be hungry, right? I, I exercise, shower, and slide into bed, and then I don't have that hunger response. And the next day I'm fine and I go back to it. So a little biohacking trick that I so do. You don't wake up starving. Hungrier than if, if I don't work out, but okay. not if I work out in the morning. I'm hungry all day. And then I'm just looking for food. It gets harder to do the diet program. Yes. And you can also just ratchet back. Like, like don't do that as intensive, intensive an exercise. Like you can do yes. a walk walk, which is still helpful. I mean, that's another way to control it. I actually like HIT. I find that if I'm plateauing, HIT will start moving things again. No question about it. Absolutely no question about it. Um, HIT is, is my cheat out of my 2000 calorie dessert that I had after a big meal. <laughs> like, I know that's my go-to. I can, you know, do, you know, 50 burpees and and all these other combinations that I found a couple of good YouTube videos, um, 20 minutes, I've completely sweating it out. But you're smart. See, I, I learned so much from your book because I do overeat after I work out. I, have, I do cryotherapy. And within 30 to 45 minutes of cryo, I will eat another massive meal. Yeah. And if I haven't had lunch and done cryo, like if I've done fasted cryo, forget it. I'm going to eat two meals back to back. Yeah. And it's amazing. Like where do all the digestive enzymes come from? I don't know, but they show up and they digest that meal. They're ready for a second. So I learned so much from you that I need to better manage uh, when I work out, knowing fully well now that that's what, what's happening. It's the ghrelin response. Yeah. Um, what do you think about supplements that promise carb control? There's a couple of actually MDs that I really like and follow, and they've got products called um, carb control, which has certain things in it, which apparently prevents um, cravings. I think they work. I, I've even tried one. I think it takes a little bit of the edge off, but it doesn't make it go completely. So if you do like a, a hit on a fasted state, that carb controls, I find it is not going to do it. Right, like like that's right. It's not yet that that nothing's going to stop. So I I think it can work. Okay, I mean green tea tablets were used for a while too, and, and they can work. And there's all kinds of diet aids and diet pills out there. Um, it just depends. It depends on how fast you're going at it, how hard you're going at it. Um, but they can be helpful. You, you know what I say is that there's no taboo to anything. If, if something works for you, even if it's a placebo effect, do it. Do it if it's not hurting you and it helps you get through the day. Right. It is the diet and I'm, I'm not someone who's going to say oh it's so easy you just follow me and you're going to lose all this weight if you really have stubborn fat this is not easy right there is a time period which this is a real adjustment you're, you're eating differently than a lot of people around you right which also feels kind of odd but you can stay with it so whatever it takes for you to stay with it you know if it's carb control if it's a placebo if it's you know whatever shake that you're taking do it as long as you're still losing weight with that thing 
And I, and I find too, you know, what's interesting is that we all respond so differently to food. So there's really good research coming out of the Weizmann Institute in Israel, right, which is looking at blood glucose and the response uh, people have. And, and so some people can eat a muffin or cookie or alcohol, they, their blood glucose level stays flat. There's no response. Other people have a bite and they have a huge spike, right, in their blood sugar levels. And so, you know, we all, we all gain and respond to food differently as well. And so that's what, what I really suggest is, is you have to monitor. Monitoring really works for dieting. You log everything you do. What time did you eat? What was the caloric content? Um, and what was your weight that morning? And if you weigh yourself every day and keep this log, you'll start to even see what's working for you. Like I know there's certain cheap foods that I'm not, that are supposed to gain weight and supposed to be, you know, a menace to a diet. I get away with it. You know, bananas, I think at one point were thought to be terrible, or rice was terrible. I can help anything, I don't gain anything from it. Maybe someone else does, but I don't. So if you keep your log and and you're weighing yourself, you start to see what's making you gain, what's making you lose, and how do you finally refine that diet to work for you. And and doing this log is how I discovered, you know, if I eat after three o'clock, I don't lose any weight. Like, it just stays on. But if there's something magical in my body about three o'clock that if I stop, it comes off again. And if I hit a plateau and if I exercise at night, wow, wow, I just lost, you know, I lost a pound that day. So you start to see your own body patterns and that's how you make your blueprint because your body is completely different, right? From someone else's body, it depends on your genetic makeup, gender, age, your dieting history. If you've yo-yo dieted, you might just have a harder time. And even the way that we process food, you know, it's very different for everybody. Not everyone's gaining weight off the same food. And so keep a log, you know, study it, you know, be studious about it. You'll, you'll come and you'll derive a diet of your own that really works for you in the end. I think for those who are listening to this, if there's one thing you walk away with today, it should be this. Your weight loss journey is yours. Don't follow books. Don't follow diets. God, please don't yo your diet. Uh, whatever you do, call it a lifestyle choice. And Figure it out for yourself. Figure it out for your body. Your body actually speaks very loudly. Uh, we just refuse to listen to it. So make notes. Um, weigh yourself, although I never weigh myself. Um, I find that I have the kind of personality which can get obsessive. And then when I get obsessive, um, I actually overeat. So my approach to staying actually in my weight range is to never, ever ever weigh myself um, and to never, ever, ever deprive myself. So if I crave brownies, I eat brownies. If I eat, I eat like I've, because the moment I start putting down barriers, like, oh, I shouldn't do that. My body goes into double time. Like, oh, really? You're going to say no to me? I think I want three cans of those or I want four brownies. So I've learned to listen to the voice in me, knowing that it doesn't like being deprived. Um, it doesn't like, you know, if, if I get obsessive, if I weigh myself, things go completely out of, out of whack. What works for me is actually distraction. So having a very clear picture of this is what I'm having, this is what I'm having, and having it ready and prepared. So I, I meal prep every night. Mm -hmm. I know exactly what I'm eating at what time the next day. And if I don't, that's when bad things happen. <laughs> You know, going into a grocery store hungry, that's when really bad things happen, like donuts show up in my, in my cart. Uh, so I think to your point, discipline is so critical. Without discipline, this isn't happening, right? So first step is just understanding, are you committing to, to being disciplined and doing this? And if you are, then taking that extra step and saying, I'm not eating after this time, I'm gonna work out, I'm gonna do a HIIT workout, I'm going to have a diary. I'm going to weigh myself. But most importantly, I'm going to listen to myself and create my own blueprint of what works for me. And then I'm going to do it for life. Mm -hmm. um, I've also found, Dr. Tara, I don't know if you can comment on this, that my body forgives me about two binges a week, right? <laughs> <laughs> I can like be really good on the weekdays and I can have a completely screwed up weekend. And my Mondays are still pretty good. But if I, if I mess up my Monday then my, then it's bad. So figuring out for yourself what your body forgives. Oh, it's great. And I love when I'm in that forgiveness mode, right? You feel like you can get away with something. And yeah. So, so bodies have a set point. It, it, and it doesn't want to go above that set point or below that set point, which is why it takes a long time to start losing weight because you have to reckon with, you know, your body has to admit it's time to lose weight. 
But at the same token, every Christmas, I go through this thing where I have to have Christmas cookies, right? Yeah. And I notice I don't gain weight right away. It actually takes a while. It, it takes a few weeks before a pound will show up because my body doesn't want to gain either. Exactly. So what you're doing, you know, you've got a set point and you, you might be eating to more than usual on the weekends, but your body doesn't really want to gain the weight. It wants to stay very steady. And it's actually a fascinating mouse research um, that was done, a study where they put a weight, a metal weight in a, a mouse's abdomen. And if, if they put that weight in, the mouse would lose weight. But if they didn't um, put the weight in, the mouse would retain weight, even, even through exercise. So there's something about weight that our body has where it wants, to, it wants to stay at a very steady weight. And so, yeah, it can work sometimes in our favor. It does for me around Christmas every year. It works exactly. Well. Exactly. So it's really the set points that are the struggle. Your body's now gotten used to being 10 pounds overweight and you yeah. need to get below that. And I couldn't agree more with you. Intermittent fasting, hit workout, cutting out a lot of the sugars and carbs, especially in the evenings, uh, trying something if you're desperate, like the carb pills. I think all of that works. Tell us about the course that you have so we can channel our folks over there. Yeah, that's sure. So the book was very rich in content, right? It was very scientific um, and it was a, you know, a fact every sentence. I think that the course now is more how to implement all the science that's in the secret life of fat. So I tried to take, you know, the science, we go through it slowly, but then there's all a, a whole section around diagnosing your fat blueprint. How do you actually put all of the science to work for you? So where are you on the fat spectrum? And if, you know, depending on where you are on the fat spectrum, there's ideas for what kind of diet might work for you, what are obvious first steps to take, and then how to tailor a diet to work for you. So there's an assessment that you take to, to figure out where you are on the fat blueprint. Um, I'm working on an intermittent fasting guide. The course will evolve over time. So whoever, you know, buys in, you get all the materials as we keep creating them. It's a kind of one-time buy-in fee Wonderful. if you will. With it, so I think it'll help people. I know, uh, you know, it's, it's done well so far, and um, it's a way of trying to put really complex science into practice for people. Because some of us just want the how-to. Don't tell us the why. Just tell us the how-to. <laughs> you know, one of the other cheats that I'll share with with anyone who's out there that's listening. I know the other thing we're all fed up of is uh, cooking. You know, it was yeah. all exciting. Everyone was into cooking yeah. when first COVID started. And, uh, and now we're all done, you know? So even though I love to cook, my daughters love to cook, mm -hmm. um, I just signed up for a subscription service with this organic, vegan, uh, dairy-free, gluten-free uh, delivery service. And it's probably a buck more per meal, which is not that much. Mm -hmm. But what I love about it is it's fully, you know, proportioned, healthy, organic meals, including breakfast, lunch, and dinner, which shows up. And to, you know, what I was sharing earlier, like I now know what I'm having tomorrow for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And that keeps my brain from wanting to, should I bake brownies? Should I eat the cookies? Like, no, no, that's kind of what we're eating. Now let's get back to work. Exactly. So for anyone out there that's struggling with sort of meal prep as well, because that in itself is a big problem. Definitely. Um, it's the same fatigue, right? When you're dieting, it's, if you're making constant decisions, I should have this, not this, or I should have this not, now, not then you start to give up after a while. It's like, I just don't care anymore. So I think it's really good advice. If you have it planned and there's no decisions to be made, it's great, right? You, you now get on with the rest of the day. You know what you're eating. It's something you like, something you can go with. And, and that's part of the mind over fat too, is you have to, you know, if you build in exercises and willpower, you're no longer making the decision. You're just doing, right? Um, like people who, who go to the gym regularly, there's, you know, they have like a something called temptation bundling where they're, they're, they're pairing like listening to a juicy audio novel with being on the treadmill or watching some like soap opera or some guilty pleasure. Like a Bridgerton kind of a soap opera. <laughs> yeah. they'll, they'll go more often to the gym. And yeah. even when you remove that, that temptation, there's no more book or soap opera, they'll still go to the gym more often because it's become automatic. It's become a pattern. A positive yeah. association. Yeah, and you're not making a decision. You're not forcing yourself. You're just doing. You want to get to the point where you're just doing as much as possible and not actually making a decision. And that frees up your mind. It doesn't feel like a barrier anymore. You just get automatic. You know, I have a, I have a dream. I want to set up a wellness retreat where people can come and reset into this model mm -hmm. because it's hard to do at home, right? Change is hard. Change is really, really hard. And so I personally feel like I wish there was a place where I could go to away from my pantry and my refrigerator and my very naughty family that doesn't 
one, we didn't lose any weight and does, you know, eats lots of ice cream in front of me when I'm trying to be good at 10 p.m. at night. To be able to go to a place for just, you know, two nights, three days where you're away from temptations, you're resetting your body, you, you don't have any option but to eat what you're being given when you're being given, and then to come back home and bring that sort of this new um, habit with you. I wish, you know, I, I'd love to do it, but I wish somebody would do it so we could all go to this place for our, our weekend resets. Um, but with that said, Dr. Tara, is there anything you haven't shared that you feel like people need to know this about fat, especially as it pertains to their weight loss journeys that you'd like to share? Yeah, and I think we've touched on some of it. One is like, know that your fat is trying to help you. You know, know that you don't need to look perfect to be healthy, right? You just have to get to a weight that's good for you. You know, we didn't talk too much about, you know, adiponectin and the role that plays in where your fat is stored. But, you know, one thing is that if you're storing fat in the right places and your subcutaneous fat, not your visceral fat, you can actually carry some, some extra pounds and it won't kill you. So that's another really important aspect. And it's important, especially for people with stubborn fat, because you might not get to the six pack glistening abs. You might live with a little bit extra fat, 10 pounds extra fat or whatever. Just make sure it's in the right places. And exercise can really help with that as well. It releases a hormone, another hormone from fat called adiponectin that helps fat get distributed in the right places in your body. So, so learn all about your fat, right? Knowledge is power. You have to know your fat to kind of control your fat. And the more you know, um, the more you're able to do that. And it's not depressing, even if you've had extraordinarily stubborn fat, even if you have every factor working against you, it's still possible, right? It just takes some effort. You have to get in the right mindset to want to do it. And don't let the perfect get in the way of the possible, right? Just really keep at it and, and, and you'll get to a weight that's healthy for you. Dr. Tara, thank you so much. That was incredibly insightful and I'm super excited about actually checking out your course as well. Uh, thank you so much again for taking the time out to come visit with us. And for the rest of you, stay in touch. Please check out healcircles.org. Uh, again, healcircles with a plural, .org. Come join us. Let's lose some weight together. Let's get healthier. I'll see you on the next podcast.